Today on Laser Update, we explore the regions of OCC, just one episode of the three-part series that aims to shine a light on the expensive journey from Midtown Plaza to Onondaga Hill. Coming up next on Laser Update. Good morning and welcome from Kathy Austin Student at on this OCC campus. This is Laser Update. I'm Francisco Costa. And I'm Emily Petoniak. From Midtown Plaza to Onondaga Hill, History of OCC covers the nearly 55-year history behind Onondaga Community College. Let's take a look. Did you know Onondaga Community College was originally located in downtown Syracuse and was known as Midtown Plaza before it was moved to Onondaga Hill in 1967? Midtown held just around 500 students with eight curriculums and was a former factory before it became OCC. The downtown location did have its benefits as far as accessibility and endless things to do in the city of Syracuse. Benefits aside, the halls were very crowded and smoking was present in the small classrooms. The campus just wasn't ideal for the increasing enrollment going into the thousands. So the move to Onondaga Hill was essential for the future of Onondaga Community College. Wow, that was life in Midtown Plaza. Crazy how different things are today. Later in the show, we'll take a look at the second episode of History of OCC and learn a little more about our college. We hear from former OCC photography student Clara Neville. Connor Fry has a story. Today, we listen to Clara Neville, a photography major here at Onondaga Community College. Sometimes you're going to have a whole photo shoot where you have the idea and you know what you want to do, but it just doesn't work out, so you have to keep trying and figure things out, and that you have to persevere. During the cancellation of the photography major, there's also, because there's such a low enrollment in that program, they um, ended up having to cancel two courses that I needed for my degree because of registration. So I'm now independent studying those courses so I can complete my degree this December, which that was a challenge in that, but still it's something that I'm going to be able to make happen. Before I'm done here, I have to um, get through my independent study work. So I have assignments for alternative process that I'm working on and for a history of photo that I'm working on, which both involve creating images. Um, and I've also been speaking to people in the C-STEP office about taking headshots for their students to use in their LinkedIn profiles and other job building opportunities. Despite the challenges she encountered throughout the two years, Clara will take the skills she learned in the photography classes at OCC past commencement in December and far into her future. It's sad to see this discontinuation of the photography major, but we wish Clara well and hope the basic photography classes stick around. OCC alumni Clara Neville returned over Zoom for a follow-up interview with Connor Fry. Having access to OCC's labs and equipment um, and having people guide me through steps of new processes when it comes to photos um, and being able to be hands-on with everything was super helpful and I don't think I would have had that opportunity at a different university or if I was online and those things. Um, and then the resource of the people that I met in building my portfolio and connecting with people was really helpful at OCC. Working with film right now and analog um, and large format cameras, which has been really interesting. And it's reminding me of OCC in the sense that like I didn't fully have the opportunity for that. Like we talked about before of um, the alternative process course getting canceled. Um, but being in a studio space again and like all this fun equipment has definitely reminded me of working at OCC as well. That was great advice at the end for current OCC students looking to transfer to Syracuse University or another four-year school. Keep your heads up OCC students. Now let's jump into a little history. We've learned quite a bit about OCC as a college, but we haven't yet talked about the ancient history of the poor house and how OCC brought life back into it. Let's take a look. The poor house, 
known now as Mulroy Hall, has changed significantly since 1901. Photos of life back in the early 1900s, as well as the original buildings, have been preserved, such as the First County Hospital, an elderly woman resting on the porch of the poorhouse, the poorhouse itself, and the women's building. Lastly, the head nurse, Miss Driscoll, in front of Pogey Pond. Unfortunately, the demolition of the poorhouse in 1998 meant losing a historic treasure and making matters worse. Dead bodies were discovered 12 years ago by an archaeology team during renovations to the land. After discovering numerous bodies, the team had to rebury them in Loomis Hill Cemetery, that being only two or so miles away from the poorhouse grounds. You may be wondering what Mulroy Hall is used for today. To answer that question, I talked to Scott Titus, Director of Marketing and New Media. We're located obviously in Mulroy Hall, um, and we uh, support the entire college for a variety of things. Um, we manage the college's websites, public facing, as well as some of the internal ones. Um, our, our external branding and advertising campaigns that we run, um, as well as a variety of internal communications too across campus. So. Uh, yeah, actually, so we, we do have a regular standing department meeting um, once a week, um, and then we're also just constantly in contact via email, and the whole team is right here in the building, the rest of the team is right next door, so, so we're constantly dropping in and out and, you know, collaborating on things all the time. I was a mere snapshot, snapshot of the expensive and somewhat depressing nature of the poorhouse. Cool to see what it is as used today. Francisco, what would you do if you were an orphan at eight years old and you were told that you were going to live in the county poorhouse? Honestly, Emily, I don't know. Interesting. The poorhouse dates back to 1826. That's nearly 200 years. A well-known child of the poorhouse was an eight-year-old girl named Dolorsky Wilkinson. Oddly, she didn't stay longer than a month before she left the poorhouse. Her whereabouts past December 10th, 1831 is unknown. Before we go to break, make sure to stick around to get the scoop on the fun facts of Mul Mulroy Hall. You won't want to miss it. This is where it happens. Photography is very inclusive. Whether you are technically inclined or more creative, the class has a spot for you. Basic photography encourages problem solving skills that will be useful in all situations, especially on the job. Students create their very own art. If you're an artist interested in creating photographs or just interested in photography in general, look no further than Basic Photography 101, room 254. Explore your potential, discover your talents, and transform your life at Onondaga Community College. Onondaga's expanding campus features four residence halls, the SRC Arena, and a new state-of-the-art building for the music department. Onondaga's diverse mix of students enriches classroom discussions, fuels creativity, and prepares you to be part of a community. Visit SUNYOCC.edu and discover why more than 40,000 students call OCC their alma mater. Explore your potential, discover your talents, and transform your life at Onondaga Community College. Onondaga's expanding campus features four residence halls, the SRC Arena, and a new state-of-the-art building for the music department. Onondaga's diverse mix of students enriches classroom discussions, fuels creativity, and prepares you to be part of a community. Visit SUNYOCC.edu and discover why more than 40,000 students call OCC their alma mater. Explore your potential, discover your talents, and transform your life at Onondaga Community College. Onondaga's expanding campus features four residence halls, the SRC Arena, and a new state-of-the-art building for the music department. Onondaga's diverse mix of students enriches classroom discussions, fuels creativity, and prepares you to be part of a community. Visit SUNYOCC.edu and discover why more than 40,000 students call OCC their alma mater. Welcome back. You may be wondering how the depressing poorhouse became the stunning Mulroy Hall. We have the answers. First, the poorhouse was officially destroyed in 1998. The county demolished it in favor of taxable income over renovating the historical site. Our last fun fact is, of course, the man Onondaga County Executive, John Mulroy. 
the fir very first Onondaga County Executive. Last time on History of OCC, we covered life at Midtown Plaza and why it needed to evolve. Today, we look at the necessary evolution that came to be Onondaga Hill and OCC as we know it today. Let's take a look. Have you ever thought about how the Onondaga Hill campus happened? Who was involved? Three men met to discuss the architectural plans for Onondaga Community College to be built on Onondaga Hill in 1967. College President Marvin Rapp, County Executive John Mulroy, and Trustee Chairman Ransom McKenzie. Architects worked on a miniature model of the campus that had to be revised and redone until it was just right. It took seven years for the campus to be finalized. The open atmosphere and nature surrounding the campus created a far more comfortable and relaxing environment as opposed to the narrow hallways and concrete jungle nature of downtown Syracuse. This is how Onondaga Community College came to be on Onondaga Hill. Wow, the campus hasn't changed much at all. It's nice to see the difference between Midtown and the campus as we know it today. Next time we'll take a look at the third episode of OCC History and learn a little bit more about our college. Now it's time for your weekly weather update. Friday, May 6th, cloudy with a high of 65 and a low of 44. Saturday, May 7th, mostly cloudy with a high of 60 and a low of 40. But last but not least, Sunday, May 8th, mostly sunny with a high of 65 and a low of 41. Get out and enjoy your fresh air lasers. Speaking about local history, we read an excerpt from the poem by Will Carlton titled Over the Hill to the Poor House. Disclaimer, it may be upset to some viewers. So they have shirked and slighted me and sh shifted me about. So we have well nigh sore me and wore my heart, old heart out. But still I've borne up pretty well and wasn't much put down till Charlie went to the poor master and put me on the town. Over the hill to the poor house, my children dear goodbye. Many a night I've watched you when only God was nigh and God will judge between us. But I will always pray that you shall never suffer the half I do today. That was very interesting. It's as if it was from the perspective of a mother reaching out to her kids for the same love and affection she gave to them, but was not welcomed by them. So off to the poorhouse she went. Exactly. The ending pulls at my heartstrings. Now we explore a, a more uplifting story. Last time on the History of OCC, we covered the construction of the Onondaga Hill campus and how it came to be. Today, we'll, we take a look at the campus as it is in 2022 and see how much or little has changed since 1967. Let's take a look. The Onondaga Community College campus has changed a lot since its construction 55 years ago upon this hill. The BMC, Broadcast Media Communications Department, has the old-fashioned tools used in live production in a hallway display. Though not as old as the equipment that was used back in the day in this very same control room, it is still very cool to see, especially as technology becomes increasingly advanced. Though Easter eggs can be found that call out one of the founding members, specifically Ransom McKenzie. He has a road named after him on this campus. Now you know the origins of Onondaga Community College. Wow, the outside looks nearly identical apart from the few, a few buildings. Crazy how you can see the similarities of the old control room compared to our modern room. That's the history of OCC, hopefully you enjoy it. First on the list, the Great Moses flew moved 35 miles per hour and was molten hot down to the streets in Boston, Massachusetts in 1919. Lastly, the Syracuse University Center of Excellence used to be an L.C. Smith and Corona typewriter company in 1911. Those are your fun Easter effects. We'll catch you after the break. Explore your potential, discover your talents, and transform your life at Onondaga Community College. Onondaga's expanding campus features four residence halls, the SRC Arena, and a new state-of-the-art building for the music department. Onondaga's diverse mix of students enriches classroom discussions, fuels creativity, and prepares you to be part of a community. 
Visit SUNYOCC.edu and discover why more than 40,000 students call OCC their alma mater. Explore your potential, discover your talents, and transform your life at Onondaga Community College. Onondaga's expanding campus features four residence halls, the SRC Arena, and a new state-of-the-art building for the music department. Onondaga's diverse mix of students enriches classroom discussions, fuels creativity, and prepares you to be part of a community. Visit SUNYOCC.edu and discover why more than 40,000 students call OCC their alma mater. It's that time of the year where everyone wants to buy Christmas gifts. But it's also that time of the year where some people don't have the money to buy them. Are you trying to make a few extra bucks to buy some gifts for this Christmas? OCC Bookstore is now hiring. Work part-time or full-time for $12.5 per hour. Located on Whitney Hall. You can work while still being a student, get job experience and still make money out of it. Apply now on SUNYOCC.eu. Explore your potential, discover your talents and transform your life at Onondaga Community College. Onondaga's expanding campus features four residence halls, the SRC Arena, and a new state-of-the-art building for the music department. Onondaga's diverse mix of students enriches classroom discussions, fuels creativity, and prepares you to be part of a community. Visit SUNYOCC.edu and discover why more than 40,000 students call OCC their alma mater. This is your scene for the week. A Trial of Chicago 7, released on Netflix on September 5th, 2020. Amazingly, it won Golden Globe Award for Best Screenplay and many other accolades. A whooping budget of $35 million, shockingly, only grossed on $115,000 worldwide. It sure is a smash hit nonetheless. Sit back, relax, and watch it after our show. You won't regret it. The infamous mask mandate that removed masks everywhere but classrooms. Let's see what students have to say about it. Today, we are finding out how the campus feels about the recent mask mandate. Um, I'm very glad that we don't have to wear masks like anywhere else around here. Um, but for um, in classes, it does make sense. Like it's a lot of people all like in a really close and close space. So it makes sense to keep wearing masks. But everywhere else, I'm, I'm actually really happy about. It's good that we're still requiring masks to be worn in class, but Outside, I am still a bit concerned because the pandemic is not over. And there already are people who are still not following that mandate. But I think as long as we're still doing the monthly testing, we should be okay. I feel like we shouldn't have to wear them at all because we're still going to be around people in the hallway no matter what without our masks on. So we're closer to them in the hallway than we are in classrooms. There you have it. Some students want the masks to come off in classes, while others support the president's decision. We'll have to wait and see what happens after spring break. I'm Connor Fry, and that's the Laser Update. County data is the key to a fully maskless college. Students seem torn between a semi-mask and fully maskless campus. Hopefully things can improve soon. Now for a more focused topic not pertaining to history, but it's precisely in an ongoing issue for communities across America. We've got an issue, and our producer, Connor Fry, sits down with Esther Ousu and Elijah Johnson to get their insight on the filthy topic of toilet plums and the potential COVID link. Warning, images and topics may be unsettling for some viewers. Let's plunge into the public bathroom debate and see what stinks. Hello, hello everyone, I'm Connor Fry, and today we are discussing public bathrooms and the potential link Joining me today are Eliza Johnson and Esther Owusu to talk about the matter. Thank you for joining me. Mm -hmm. Eliza, yeah. how do you feel about public bathrooms? You know, I've never really liked them at all. Just being that in that awkward position where you go in there and you see like so many like different scenarios with like pee on the floor, maybe potentially some poop. No toilet paper, what's up with that? You know, uh, you know sometimes you gotta take a dump and there's none in there. Um, just overall, I think public bathrooms are just like the bane of my existence. I've never had a good experience in any of them. Yeah, like during the pandemic with the toilet paper shortage, everyone's like freaking out, stealing yeah. toilet paper. Yeah, like the whole thing with that is just like when you go to use the bathroom, you expect to see some toilet paper there. So not having any at all is just like a bewilderment to me. 
And I think just at this point, I'm just going to start bringing my own. <laughs> That's a good idea. Now, Esther, my next question is for you. Did you know there was a potential link to COVID because public bathrooms don't have toilet lids? No, I actually did not know that. And I think that's going to make people scared and be more afraid. So how Elijah is saying that, um, not Elijah, you were talking about how people were taking like toilet paper when COVID happened. Then now people are going to start buying hand sanitizers and all that. But I, I did not know that at all. Yeah, Who came up with that? Imagine how bad it would have been to be in a public bathroom during the pandemic for like essential workers. Like imagine what hospitals were like while they had so many COVID patients. It must have been horrible. Like my um, sister was in New Rochelle. Now, how do you feel about public bathrooms like in general? Like you work in a hospital. I do. What are public, ba what are public bathrooms like there? Public bathroom like there is, it's, it's a hot mess and it doesn't go to the workers that clean the bathroom. It's the people that use the bathroom. Like how he talks about sometimes you're going to use a bathroom and then they like don't flush and they flick like toilet papers on the floor and then it's like I'm not about to do this. So either I have to like bend or like do something to just you know use the bathroom. It's just horrible. It's very horrible. So how do I feel about like public bathroom in general? I think people need to bring their own like wipes to clean every time they use a bathroom, honestly, because some people are pretty dirty, like dirty. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When we come back, our discussion continues right here on God Issues. Welcome back, Connor Fry here again. I'm with Elijah Johnson and Esther Wusu, and we've been talking, let's continue. Elijah, do you feel clean after using a public bathroom? You know, it has to be funny you say that because I had a phenomenal time at the state fair last year. So when I went to the state fair last year, uh, I used for the first time in my existence a porta potty. So um, the thing was, I didn't know that, like you know, when you sit down and stuff like that, it's a little bit rocky. So I was fishing for some toilet paper and I fell over and just. Things got very messy from there. So overall, um, it's just public bathrooms. Like, that's really all I could say. Esther, how do you feel about toilet plumes? And it's all right if you don't know what they are. Um, toilet plumes, can you explain what that means? Toilet plumes is an MIT definition from the director of student health. And that means that there's droplets in the toilet every time you flush it. Mm -hmm. In a public bathroom, as we know, doesn't have lids. So you flush it, and let's say you had like horrible diarrhea from like Taco Bell, all those droplets are gonna fly in a vortex, hit you in the back, hit you in the face, get all everywhere. How do you feel about that? And that's gross to even think about it. I can't even feel it. It's just gross, you know. They should have maybe toilet lids so that people can like close and open. Because imagine if your phone fell, fell in the toilet. That means you are experiencing something that somebody has already done in that. So they should do something about it, or we should take it upon ourselves to be able to like take a step back when you flush the toilet. Because I do that all the time. If I want to use the bathroom, I like stretch my legs, and especially public bathroom, and flush, and then I move back because the water that comes out is just like it's having an issue with me. So yeah, nah, it's gross for me. But now, since we're talking about public bathroom lids, do you, most households have lids. Do you think it'd be really expensive? to incorporate lids? Or do you think it's a liability if we have lids? It's not. Actually, it's not expensive. I think it's like $20 to get a lid. You can take it off and put it back on and people have like fancy stuff. So I wonder why toilet, you know, public toilet, they don't have that. They should just do that for the safety and whatever they talk about. Like They should have that. In certain places, they should. You know, like the mall, the hospital, they should have stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I agree with you, or if that's what, they should have that. Now Elijah, how often do you go to Destiny USA? Now I would say about maybe on a good day, a good week actually, uh, four or five times. How often do you use the bathroom? Probably once or twice. Now, <laughs> now let's think about the lids. You said it'd be about $20 per lid. And let's just assume you know, Dustin USA has four stories. Obviously, the fourth floor is where the offices are. All right. Um, how expensive do you think it'd be to put lids 
simply investing in USA. Like $20 for how many toilets? I, I don't think it'd be expensive at all. Like, honestly, like, it, it's a lid. Like, with all the money that's garnered from so many, you know, um, outlets all right. and things like that, you know? I totally agree. I'd like to thank my guests, Esther Wusu and Eliza Johnson, and hope you've enjoyed watching. We may not have resolved anything today, but without the ability to talk freely about the things that concern us, there is little chance of moving forward. I'm Connor Fry, and that's Got Issues. That was very interesting, and perhaps a little gross. This exciting ride has been your laser update. I'm Emily Petoniak. And I'm Francis Costa. We wish you a wonderful day from the Kathy Hawkins studio on the OCC campus. Thank you.